This is a continuation of the video blog on the legal non-conforming short-term rentals uh, which were banned by recent provincial new legislation in the province of BC. We are now finishing off analyzing who are the winners and losers in all of this. If you've not seen part one of this video, then go to the link above to watch the first part. It really makes a lot more sense if you do this. Then come back to part two to get the final analysis on the remaining stakeholders and who the winners and losers are. Okay, our next group of stakeholders are municipal residents. Win or lose. Residents may think they are not affected by this new banning of non principal residents, legal non-conforming short-term rentals. However, what many may not realize is that the owners of these units do collect the 8% provincial sales tax, the 3% municipal and regional district tax, 5% federal government sales tax, the GST, a 0.5% speculation tax on the assessed value of each property each year, and in Victoria, currently a $1,500 per year annual business license. Many other municipalities also collect a business license fee. Also, all owners pay property taxes as well as the federal and provincial income taxes on the income made in their rentals, and they also pay capital gain taxes when they sell their rentals. They also spend thousands of dollars for supplies and services in the community each year. Locally, the City of Victoria has benefited by over $1 million in licensing fees each year since 2018 and has also received significant amounts from the MRDT funds, which were used last year to aid building 88 affordable housing units in the city. The city has suggested that all the business license fees have been used for inspection compliance, but in fact, none of the licensed legal non-conforming units require inspections and have little interaction with city staff. Most of the cost is in the principal resident short-term rentals, which pay a very small licensing fee. These are the rentals hosted in people's own homes, which the city needs to inspect before approving the business license. Also, Victoria has indicated their significant contributions to affordable units, indicating there is significant monies left over for the licensing and the MRDT funds to contribute to this. All these beneficial amounts will be reduced severely or disappear entirely once the short-term rentals are disallowed. These short-term rental funds collected have in fact been a cash cow for the City of Victoria and other municipalities and for the province of BC, and as well for provincial and federal taxes. The City will need to either find other sources of taxes to continue their proposed expenditure programs this coming year by possibly further increasing property owner taxes or else by reducing the number of programs such as affordable housing initiatives. Cities cannot run a deficit and must balance their budgets each year. This is not a clear win for residents who may be facing higher taxes and lower services provided by the city. Now, the next group is BC and out of province tourists, win or lose. As a short-term rental operator, I talk with every one of our guests. I often ask them why they choose our condo. Invariably, they will say things like, well, it has a kitchen, which makes the stay less expensive. It's fully equipped. It's larger. It has a laundry. It is located within walking distance of all the downtown core tourist attractions and restaurants. And mostly it is less expensive with a lot more to offer than the hotels and motels in the area. The Destination Victoria Group has estimated that a tourist couple spends around $534 per day in accommodation, services, and tourist activities. My own calculations based on the average number of our guests, which is around 880 person stays per year, which we host annually, at a lower estimate of $250 per person per day, suggest our own guests just for our one unit spend more than $220,000 per year while in Victoria. For the 634 licensed legal non-conforming condos, even discounting this by 25% suggests that the money spent is way more than the $83 million as reported by the Property Rights of BC Group analysis. And this is dollars spent per year by our guests in Victoria, not just for legal non-conforming condos. There are also those tourists staying in hotels and other accommodation types. So the industry generates a lot of revenue and jobs in the city, and it's very important because Victoria is a tourist city, and tourists need to go where they can afford to stay. The short-term rental competition with the hotels and motels has kept a lid on the hotel and motel prices. Now that short-term rentals will be disallowed in May 2024, will we see hotel prices increasing? 
we are already seeing this happen in Vancouver where short-term rentals are heavily regulated and many were shut down. As an example, I will talk about the Taylor Swift concert boosting room prices shortly. Although there is much media hype about the hotel industry against the short-term rentals, hotels in fact have been buying up a large number of single condos and villas and are now operating these as premium hotels which are essentially short-term rentals and provided with no in-house staff. People check in by themselves and if they need anything an outside hotel employee will bring things by. For tourists this regulation is definitely a loss. Higher room prices and lower availability in BC means it might be cheaper and easier to go somewhere else like the USA or Alberta. Tourists want good accommodation at an affordable price. Another group are the specialty transients. Win or lose. Many people need accommodation for a few months. This includes people coming for cancer treatment in centers like Victoria or Vancouver where cancer units are located. There are doctors and traveling nurses, construction workers, installers, people renovating their homes or waiting to get possession of their new homes. There's film industry workers and more. All these people need comfortable homes with kitchens and laundry facilities where they can live while temporarily visiting a city for a few months. The new classification on short-term rentals being 90 days or less, these people can no longer stay in these legal non-conforming condos and are forced to stay in either basement suites or in pricey hotels and motels. This forces them to go out for every meal if in hotels and be forced to pay the higher prices. This is definitely not a win for this group. Another group is hotels and motels, win or lose. Well, the previous groups have substantially been losers so far, but now we have a change. According to the McGill report, it was the BC Hotels Association that funded the single study used by the provincial government. Upon the announcement of the new legislation, their management bragged publicly about the success of their lobbying and said it was a great day for hotels because this would benefit them all greatly. With the elimination of thousands of competing short-term rentals, the hotels and motels now will have a virtual monopoly on stays in BC and will be able to raise prices without any competition from the short-term rentals. For example, prices from the Taylor Swift concert next year in Vancouver already have been seeing gouging of prices with some hotels and motel rooms increasing over $1,000 per night for the concerts. See the link below here for more details on that. The Hotel Association and the City of Victoria are happy to announce in Victoria the building of five new hotels in the next few years. These locations could have just as easily been used for building affordable housing units, but both the City of Victoria and the Hotel Association think their model is the best. And it is the best for the hotels, but not so much for the tourist traveler or for temporary workers who will have much more expensive and less suitable accommodations while staying in Victoria. It is a resounding win for the hotel and motel group. So finally we look at the provincial government, win or lose. What is their motivation in all of this? The following are my own thoughts, but things do seem somewhat apparent, so bear with me. The BC Premier and his desire to form another government in October has jumped on the affordable housing bandwagon as this is a very sweet spot in the public minds at this point. It is necessary to throw out the big guns and we are seeing that was almost weekly major housing announcements. I could say a lot more on this as the zoning removal changes around transit points around the province, the overriding by the province of official community plans, etc. But since that is off topic for this blog, I will leave that to another video, so watch for that. Do we believe the provincial government is only interested in developing affordable living units? History does not show that. Most provincial and federal governments have not really done anything near to what was done in the 1970s to increase affordable housing. Instead, with years of rock-bottom interest rates, with banks giving almost anyone working a cheap home loan, it does not take a rocket scientist to see that housing prices were pushed up a lot. The federal government has increased immigration numbers significantly, which I personally think is a good thing for Canada, and many of these people are coming to BC adding additional housing pressure. Basic economics and the law of supply and demand and cheap money meant that prices could continually increase. Every realtor knows that when a property sells in a neighborhood that instantly all comparable properties of that neighborhood now have the same or higher value. And it's a crazy cycle. 
And it's a bit ridiculous with new lot prices in Victoria being over $750,000. That is the reason multiple unit housing is being promoted. If you can build six or 60 units on the same lot, then this decreases the per unit price significantly. It is faulty logic to blame the whole cost increase and unaffordability on the short-term rentals. This just does not bear out as other studies have indicated. So how does this help the provincial government? With an election looming in October 2024, and possibly sooner, the affordable housing legislation provides a powerful motivation to voters to support the current provincial government because they don't understand the legislation. Even though there is no actual proof that this legislation will provide any additional affordable housing, at least in Victoria, most people that I have talked to do not understand the fact that none of the legal non-conforming units will be affordable to anyone except high-income earners. These are mostly located in the most expensive parts of most cities and especially in Victoria's downtown. And in many municipalities, as in Victoria, there is already a large selection of condo units available on the market for the high income group. They also don't understand that affordable basement units in many homes will be lost as they convert to short term rental use. They also don't understand the harm to the tourist industry and workers that will occur when tourists go elsewhere. To me at least, this whole messaging by the province about how destroying the legal non-conforming short-term rentals to benefit affordable housing is totally without merit and it is certainly not a good reason to consider that the provincial government deserves to benefit from this while such great harm is imposed on the mum and pop legal non-conforming short-term rental owners. We really do live in a crazy province. Yes, the provincial government may be a big winner in this which will likely show up at the next election. The BC taxpayers, however, are not likely to be winners in this, and the individual owners of the units will suffer great losses and harm that they do not deserve. Other jurisdictions handle this in different ways. Finally, let's talk about what other jurisdictions are doing in Canada for short-term rentals. A much better approach has been proposed by the City of Winnipeg which makes a reasonable model for cooperation between short-term rental owners and the BC cities. Winnipeg recognizes the importance of the short-term rental accommodations and its impact on the city's revenues. This is their plan for short-term rentals on or before February 23, 2023. Number one is owners must be a permanent resident of the city of Winnipeg or a corporation wholly owned by residents of the city of Winnipeg. Number two, is an individual owner can license up to four existing short-term rentals with one primary residence and up to three non-primary residences, provided they own them on or before February 23, 2023. This keeps any large owners with multiple units from taking over the short-term rental industry. This seems workable and will not impose the short-term rental owners the significant financial losses that will be brought about by the BC legislation. Finally, I just want to mention a recent conversation with one of our out-of-province guests when we told them that if they wanted to book again, that their stay must end by April 30th, 2024, as we would no longer be licensed to operate our currently legal licensed short-term vacation rental after that. They said that although they did not have lots of money, that each year for 11 years they had been coming to Victoria for a month in the winter. This was the time they purchased all their seasonal clothing and they went out for dinners and tourist activities every day and spent the bulk of their travel funds here exclusively. They said that unfortunately they could not afford to stay in hotels for a month in Victoria due to higher prices and they would be looking for a place outside of the province for their next winter stay. They expressed their sympathy towards the short-term rental owners in BC. I know this was a long blog, but there was a lot to talk about. So check out the Property Rights Association of BC the Provincial Short-Term Accommodation Act regulations and the other links mentioned in the video. These links are in the description below. Please leave your comments below and let me know if you think this ban on short-term rentals will really help affordable living in BC. What are your suggestions to help out affordable housing? All comments are appreciated and I will answer any reasonable questions. For more real estate content, please have a look at one of the videos below. I want to thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.